Part one, the intellectual life. If the university serves science and scholarship, and if science and scholarship are meaningful only insofar as they are part of a comprehensive intellectual life, then this intellectual life is the very lifeblood of the university. Intellectual life can take many forms apart from that of the university. At the university, it is characterized by an institutionalized and orderly collaboration of scholars. Thus, in order to understand the idea of the university and its institutional forms, we must say something about the intellectual life in general and about the nature of science and scholarship in particular. Chapter 1. The Nature of Science and Scholarship Basic Characteristics of Science and Scholarship Science and scholarship represent a kind of knowledge which is methodical, cogent, and universally valid. Let us take up each of these three characteristics of scientific knowledge. First of all, science and scholarship are inseparable from a sense of method. The subject I am working with itself determines how I must go about getting results. My method defines the point of view and limits of the material I am working with. The very opposite of scientific thinking is unmethodical guesswork and an uncritical acceptance of ideas on good faith. Even if what is accepted in this way happens to be the result of scientific inquiry, that does not make the uncritical acceptance of ideas any the less unscientific. Such knowledge is, in fact, a sort of superstitious science worship. Unless I myself have control over the ideas which I accept, I fall a defenseless victim to those ideas. Knowledge retains its relativity only when we understand the method by which it was attained, when we understand its point of view and its significance. When we do not qualify fact, it becomes deceptively absolute. Secondly, scientific knowledge is cogent. Kind of truth which I can understand scientifically is a matter of purely rational evidence. It is right as it stands and requires no additional personal commitment on my part. Conviction is the very opposite of this form of knowledge. Its truth hinges on my personal commitment to it in terms of my own life. That is why Galileo could meaningfully recant before the Inquisition. After retracting his moving earth hypothesis, he is reputed to have said, but it moves nonetheless. This is true not to the letter, but to the spirit of what took place. Galileo knew that his disavowal could not change the truth. In Bruno, on the other hand, a willingness to make concessions and retract all non-essential doctrine went hand in hand with a heroic refusal to disavow his most basic philosophical convictions. Their truth, because it was not cogent on a purely theoretical plane, would have been refuted by Bruno's disavowal. Thus, their truth was properly not established until proven in terms of the philosopher's unwavering and enthusiastic endorsement. Thirdly, scientific findings have universal validity. Their cogency can be verified by anyone. Because of this, the dissemination of scientific knowledge is coextensive with the presence of the scientific outlook. Consensus is the mark of universal validity. Therefore, scientific truth prevails wherever people think in scientific terms. In philosophy, such universal validity is conspicuously absent. For if a given philosophical conviction could command universal acceptance, it would not need any personal commitment to it. Conversely, the relativity of scientific knowledge is connected with its universal acceptance. Research could not progress if its universally cogent findings were valid in an absolute sense. The narrower and wider concept of science. This concept of scientific knowledge, simple though it is, has been slow in evolving and is perpetually threatened. It requires our unending effort in its behalf. Science is not the whole of thought. If it were, the child's earliest attempts at symbolizing would be science. Science, moreover, is not tantamount to arranging concepts in logical sequence. It is not the rational ordering of concepts and phenomena, either. Science does not begin until sharp boundaries are drawn within the whole of thought, marking off the scientific form of knowledge from the unscientific forms. Science in the narrower and proper sense arose conjointly with the extension of knowledge. It began as a science of discovery, as research. This research became methodical in a new way. A trial hypothesis is tested, confirmed, or refuted in practice. This is a battle with the data. The data is not taken for granted, but examined as to its possible implications. 
we implement our desire for ever-increasing accuracy by putting our hypothesis in mathematical language and refining our observations through better measurements. To make coincidence or disagreement between hypothesis and observation fruitful as criteria, we must first define with maximal accuracy the terms of this agreement or disagreement, as in hypothesis and observation itself. Science not only outstripped all previous standards of universal cogency, but clarified its own assumptions in each case. It is objective only in the sense of considering all assumptions tentative and rejecting any that obscure or distort truth and reality for the sake of a particular bias. Science employs trial hypotheses which it fully acknowledges as such and which it tries out for their potential fruitfulness as tools of discovery. Only experience can test the truth of scientific assumptions. The success or failure of any hypothesis is due to factors beyond the particular application of the hypothesis, but involves the whole of truth. Is it chance which favors a few among a multitude of speculations and disregards the rest? Is it his luck, his unforeseen closeness to reality which directs a scientist's choice? Is it an unaccountable intuitive power? In retrospect, the great discoveries always seem to follow naturally from their underlying principles, yet in their day, the full theoretical significance of these discoveries was never entirely clear. How were Galileo and Lavoisier able to set in motion trends of investigation which, along with new offshoots, continue to be effective to this very day? Thus, for example, Lavoisier made certain assumptions, all of which were made before him, but which he was the first to elevate to the status of permanent and unqualified truths. That which can be dissolved no further is an element. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Weight is the reliable index of mass, as all matter is subject to the same force of gravity. Scales had been used before his time, but he was the first to rule out, as a matter of basic principle, any exception or compromise with, lo with logical consistency which would interfere with the evidence of his scale readings. Lavoisier's assumptions ran counter to sense evidence. This flagrant discrepancy constituted a standing temptation to abandon these assumptions. What then makes Lavoisier different from a speculative fanatic? Was his achievement due to his intellectual caliber or just happy coincidence? Neither. The reason his theory succeeded was that scientists were prepared to accept the absolute truth of his presuppositions since they could independently verify his experiments. Every era has had its self-appointed custodians of truth who greet any radical attempt to introduce new premises with a storm of protest. All that such criticism accomplishes is this, that all branches of learning work with hypotheses of only relative validity which do not describe reality itself but only particular aspects of its appearance. Presuppositions have only tentative validity. What few hints there are among the countless intellectual efforts of pure speculation are usually amazingly productive. Hence the genuine scholar and scientist distrusts all pure speculation which cannot furnish proof of past or future fruitfulness. What characterizes science then is this. We cannot achieve universally valid and cogent knowledge of reality except within a framework of assumptions which we know to be only relatively valid. The new science began as a mathematical science of nature motivated by a revolutionary concept, the universal applicability of the scientific method. Even Greek science, with the exception of certain forms of mathematics and Platonism, lived by the idea of initial perfection and thought of itself as essentially complete. Its universality was based on the conception of a closed, finite cosmos. On the other hand, the universality of the new science does not reside in an all-inclusive world system, but in open-minded readiness to subject everything to scientific investigation. True, the form of Greek science survives to the present day. It survives in the average understanding as a distortion of the real meaning of modern science. Modern science is prepared to penetrate even deeper into the infinite expanse of being by continuing to build upon previous discovery. It endeavors to search out things hitherto unnoticed, to realize not a cosmos, but the idea of a cosmos of scientific methods and the unity of science in an open-ended universe. Along with the new openness of inquiry, there arose a new sense of the richness of reality and of the gaps between the different levels of being, the lifeless, the living, the soul, the mind. 
people also gained a new systematic awareness of the different categories of understanding. At first, the new scientists impoverished reality by reducing it to causal, logical, and quantitative terms, measuring, counting. In short, they wanted to make the world understandable in terms familiar from the production of artifacts. Gradually, however, the categories of understanding were more clearly defined, without the sacrifice of any already existing ones. Everywhere there was a shift of focus to what is universally valid and cogent. In achieving clarity about its own methods and limitations, the new science necessarily set free that mode of thought from which it differed. For there is a type of thinking which produces insights without universal validity and cogency, yet of fundamental importance to life itself. This type of thinking penetrates to the heart of reality, not through analysis, but through flashes of insight. Because science is limited to the cogent and universally valid, scientific research and discovery is limited to the study not of being itself, but of its appearances. Opposed to this narrower concept of science, there is a broader one. Science can acknowledge this broader concept as complementary and perhaps even basic to itself, provided confusions are avoided. The type of thinking which illumines by flashes of insight is not part of science, but has its own independent roots. Science in this wider sense includes any clear understanding obtained through rational and conceptual means. Thinking so understood does not provide insights into matters hitherto unfamiliar, but clarifies what it is I really mean, want, or believe. Science in this broader sense is identical with the, with the area of lucid self-knowledge. Then there is a form of thought, speculative philosophy, for example, which requires our personal commitment in order to achieve the status of truth. Finally, thought may function as a cipher or code, simultaneously disclosing and concealing reality. These splendid and life-inspiring efforts of the human mind are scientific solely by virtue of their clarity and rigor. They are at the same time more and less than science. They are more insofar as they are a creative way of thinking, one that transforms man. They are less than science insofar as they do not yield any concrete knowledge. It is therefore of decisive importance to know what is meant by the narrower concept of science. This is the concept which modern man has in mind, however vaguely, when he speaks of science. For it alone concerns itself with cogent, universally valid knowledge, and thus does not require my total personal commitment. Moreover, the very clarity of science throws into bold relief what is unique and indispensable in the aims, evidence, and procedure of philosophy. For philosophy cannot fully realize its possibilities except side by side with science in distinction from science, and in aiming beyond science. The Limits of Science Science in the narrower sense is irrevocably limited in the following ways. Scientific knowledge of things is not the knowledge of being. Scientific knowledge is of the particular. It is directed toward clearly designated objects, not toward being itself. By the very knowledge which it achieves, science emphatically highlights its philosophic ignorance concerning being itself. Scientific knowledge cannot provide life with goals, values, or direction. The very clarity of science points to a source other than science for human life as a whole. Science, moreover, is unable to tell us its essential meaning. Its existence is due to motives whose truth and cogency are themselves beyond scientific demonstration. The limits of science have always been the source of bitter disappointment when people expected something from science that it was not able to provide. Take the following examples. A man without faith seeking to find in science a substitute for his faith on which to build his life. A man unsatisfied by philosophy seeking an all-embracing universal truth in science. A spiritually shallow person, growing aware of his own futility in the course of engaging in the endless reflections imposed by science. In every one of these cases, science begins as an object of blind idolatry and ends up as an object of hatred and contempt. Disenchantment inevitably follows upon these and similar misconceptions. One question remains, what value can science possibly have when its limitations have become so painfully clear? Science as utilitarian versus science as an end in itself. 
Since Bacon and Descartes, people have sought to justify science by pointing to its usefulness. Descartes considered the following as decisive motivations for science. Its uses for labor-saving devices, for the better fulfillment of human wants, for the improvement of health, for improved efficiency on the political and communal levels, finally, even for the invention of a scientific morality. On closer inspection, we see first that all technical applicability has its limits. Technology is only one field in the vast realm of human possibility. Secondly, the great fundamental discoveries are manifestly not due to the considerations of their practical utility. Such discoveries were made without any thought to their applicability. They well up from levels of the inquiring mind which we cannot control or predict. Fruitful application in a host of particular inventions is possible only once the theoretical groundwork has been laid. The spirit of research and the pragmatic spirit of invention differ essentially. It would be absurd, to be sure, to contest either the usefulness of science or its right to serve the practical ends of living. These do give meaning to some branches of science. But practical usefulness cannot be the whole or the only meaning of science. This is because the need for certain inventions did not give rise to science. The great discoverers were not, on the whole, not inventors. Invention alone could not keep scientific research alive permanently. Some people have countered the subordination of science to technology and the improvement of living conditions by solemnly pronouncing science an end in itself. Indeed, science is an end in itself to the extent that it expresses man's fundamental and primary thirst for knowledge. This thirst for knowledge intrinsically precedes all considerations of usefulness, for knowledge reduced to pragmatic terms is not the whole of knowledge. Man's fundamental quest does not stand or fall with any one educational ideal of history. Here knowledge is valued exclusively from the standpoint of common standards and forms and for its ability to shape the whole person according to the accepted ideal. Plain curiosity, the naive desire to see the strange and unknown and to learn about them at second hand in the form of experience and results, comes closer to preserving the primary freshness of man's quest for knowledge, but curiosity only touches things without seizing them. Quickly aroused, it quickly loses interest. Before it can become an element of knowledge, curiosity must first be transformed. Thus transformed, it no longer requires justification of any sort and is correspondingly less able to account for itself. Man alone among all other beings considers himself a human only so long as he involves himself in the process of knowledge. He alone is willing to face the consequences of this knowledge. He takes this risk because, regardless of the consequences to his personal existence, truth is his reward. Indeed, we come to know ourselves only insofar as we come to grips with the world about us, with the various levels and kinds of knowledge, and with the intellectual formulation of possible lines of thought and action. Man's primary will to know struggles against the self-satisfied formalism of empty learning, which drugs man in the illusory calm of fulfillment. It fights against empty intellectualism, against nihilism, which has ceased wanting anything and thus has ceased wanting to know. It battles against mediocrity, which never takes stock of itself, and which confuses knowledge with the mere learning of facts and results. The only satisfaction which man derives from a radical commitment to knowledge is the hope of advancing the frontier of knowledge to a point beyond which he cannot advance except by transcending knowledge itself. The slogan, science, an end in itself, was coined to express man's primary and unconditional thirst for knowledge. It has been erroneously taken to certify the intrinsic value of any factual discovery whatsoever, of each and every correct application of method, extension of knowledge, and scientific occupation. Chaos ensued. There was the uncounted mass of arbitrary factual finding, the diffusion of the sciences into a vast unrelated aggregate, the complacency of specialists ignorant of and blind to the larger implications, the triumph of the production line approach to learning, forever losing itself in the endless waste of, of mere factual correctness. Mechanized and drained of all meaning, intrinsic or human, science became suspect along with its claim to have intrinsic value. The motto, science, an end in itself, is an ill repute. The much-invoked crisis of science resulted in the disavowal of all of its meaning. It was claimed that science will serve any master, that it is a whore, 
that it leaves the soul empty, that it is a production line indifferent to the human heart, that essentially it spends its time carting rubble back and forth. These charges do apply to a degenerate pseudoscience, but not to man's primary quest for knowledge. If, for medieval man, knowledge culminated in the vision of God, if Hegel, in all seriousness, spoke of logical thinking as an act of religious worship, if even the logical positivist acknowledges the existence of the unknowable, then we too can experience human fulfillment in truth. More radically than ever before, men are thinking about what truth is. Modern man remains intensely alive in the ancient wisdom that nothing except the discovery of truth gives meaning to our life, even though we lack final certainty to what that meaning is and what it implies. That nothing is exempt from our desire for knowledge and that, above all, life seeks to base itself upon thought. These age-old insights, irreducible to psychology and sociology, have attested man's higher origin. The only access to these conclusions is by way of science. It remains to clarify the nature of true science conceived in this way, the basic assumptions of science. The slogan, science assumes nothing, was meant as a battle cry against restrictions, which would have been imposed upon learning in the form of specific unquestionable dogmas. The battle cry was justified to the extent that it signified science's refusal to commit itself to preconceived conclusions, to limit the scope of its inquiry, to consider anything as taboo or to sidestep certain inevitable conclusions. In fact, however, there is no such thing as a science without assumptions. What is characteristic of science is that it recognizes and clarifies these assumptions in a spirit of self-criticism. Strictly speaking, science represents a tentative body of thought aware of itself and aware that whatever validity and consistency it has derives from certain specific assumptions. Thus, science presupposes the validity of the rules of logic. Where the principle of contradiction is denied, thinking and knowing are impossible. Thought intrinsically recognizes this principle. Where concepts are allowed to become vague and equivocal, where self-contradiction is not deemed an objection, speech itself has ceased to be meaningful communication. Any statement denying certain logical assumptions must respect them, at least for the duration of this very denial. Whoever is unwilling to acknowledge these assumptions is unamenable to argument and can only be left alone like the irrational plant to which, in Aristotle's phrase, he has degraded himself. We are mistaken, therefore, when we absolutize knowledge. Knowledge is possible only where the laws of logic are respected. Consequently, what is known is not being, per se, but those aspects of reality which present themselves in terms of the conditions imposed by our own thinking process. Moreover, science presupposes its own desirability. It is impossible to defend science on grounds themselves scientific. No science can prove its value to one who denies it. Man's primary craving for knowledge is autonomous. We crave knowledge for its own sake, a passion whose self-affirmation remains the permanent premise of all science. A further important assumption of science pertains to the choice of subject to be investigated. The scientist selects his problem from among an infinite number of possibilities. Obscure instincts, love and hatred may motivate his choice. In every case, it is will, not scientific knowledge, which makes him decide to take up a particular subject. Lastly, science presupposes that we let ourselves be guided by ideas. It is only through such schemes of ideas, as Kant called them, that our minds are guided by the encompassing whole around us, even though this encompassing whole cannot itself become an object of cognition, and all our conceptual schemes have only auxiliary and provisional significance. Ideas and hypotheses are thus auxiliary constructs, which must disappear again, for they are inevitably finite and thus inevitably false. Yet without such ideas to guide us, there is no unity of focus, no direction, no distinction between trivial and important, basic and superficial, significant and meaningless, wholeness and diffusion. They form the context which motivates our special interests, permits flashes of insight and discovery, and lends meaning to pure chance. The unending number of conceptual outlines guiding us, futile as they are each alone, are our only way of relating ourselves to the infinite. Yet these guiding ideas have to come alive in the scholar himself before learning can have any meaning. 
All sciences make such assumptions. To these may be added the particular assumptions of particular disciplines. The theologian, for instance, believes in miracles and revelation. These topics are inaccessible and therefore non-existent to empirical science, so far as scientific explanations are concerned. Jaspers here quotes Max Weber saying, Since science disclaims assumptions of a theological kind, it requires the believer to admit no less, but also no more than this. Granted that a given sequence of events is to be explained without reference to supernatural interference, such being an inadmissible as empirical cause, then this sequence must be explained in the manner attempted by science. End quote. Any believer can admit this much without becoming untrue to his faith. Theological science proceeds differently. Assuming the existence of revelation, theology clarifies the implications and consequences of this faith. It develops special categories to express the inexpressible. Both explanations, the secular and the theological, operate with assumptions. They are not, strictly speaking, mutually exclusive. Both are forms of thought which work with assumptions and see where and how far they will get with them. Both remain scientific so long as they acknowledge one another and remember in a self-critical spirit that no ability is but a mode of being within being, never being per se. When we point out that all science proceeds from necessary assumptions, it is equally important to make clear what, contrary to widespread belief, we need not assume, that the world is entirely knowable, or that knowledge deals with being itself, or that knowledge is somehow absolute in the sense of containing or providing non-hypothetical knowledge. The converse is apparent the moment we reflect on the limits of knowledge. Nor does science presuppose a dogmatic Weltschwung, or worldview. Quite the contrary, science exists only to the extent that such a Weltanschwung worldview does not enjoy absolute validity, or if it does, only if its results can survive the crucial test of unbiased examination to the extent, in short, that Weltanschwung remains a mere hypothesis. For decades, people have noisily denied, no critical student has ever asserted it, that science can dispense with assumptions. It is useful to point out the dangers attendant upon this one-sided emphasis. All too easily, all meaning is drained out of the sciences and concentrated on the premises alone, thus rendering them dogmatic. Well-meaning people, but poor craftsmen, unproductive in the sciences and uninterested in methodical study, reject what they do not even know. In place of science, they want something entirely different. Politics, church, propaganda for various irrational drives. Instead of working hard and devotedly at their subjects and looking at things concretely, they allow themselves to slip into pseudo-philosophical talk, generally about the whole, the total picture. The most necessary of all presuppositions for science is a sense of direction. It has often been forgotten that science even so much as needs direction. Science needs direction. Left to itself, science loses this sense of direction. For a while, it may seem to advance spontaneously, but this is but the lingering momentum of an impulse itself due to a deeper cause. Soon, however, contradictions become apparent which threaten to bring about the collapse of the entire structure. Science as a whole is neither true nor alive without the faith on which it rests. This can be expressed in another way. Unable to fend for itself, science needs direction. Where this direction comes from and what meaning it imparts to science is decisive for the self-realization of science. Neither utility nor science as an end in itself can, so we have seen, constitute the real impulse for scientific activity. Agencies external to science may, to be sure, utilize it as a means to non-scientific ends, but then the full meaning of science remains veiled. If, on the other hand, scientific knowledge becomes its own ultimate aim, then science is meaningless. The direction must come from within, from the very roots of all science, from the unqualified will to know. In submitting to the guidance of this primary thirst for knowledge, we are not ultimately led by some goal we can know or name in advance. We are led by something we find growing ever keener as we master knowledge, that is, by responsive reason. How is this possible? Our primary thirst for knowledge is not just a causal interest. It is a compelling necessity for us which forces us on as if knowledge held the very key to our human self-realization. No one piece of knowledge can satisfy us. 
tirelessly, we keep on going, hoping to embrace the very universe through knowledge. Propelled as it is by our primary thirst for knowledge, this search is guided by our vision of the oneness of reality. We strive to know particular data, not in and for themselves, but as the only way of getting at that oneness. Without reference to the whole of being, science loses its meaning. With it, on the other hand, even the most specialized branches of science are meaningful and alive. This oneness or wholeness of reality is not to be found in any one place. All I can ever know is a particular instance among an endless variety of things. Thus, what determines the actual direction of any inquiry is our ability to perpetuate, yet continuously to interrelate, two elements of thought. One is our will to know the infinite variety and multitude of reality which forever eludes us. The other is our actual experience of the unity underlying this plurality. Still, that experience of utility cannot be had except as we face up to the fragmentary character of all human knowledge. In one sense, then, science makes us face the facts pure and simple. Ever more sharply, we realize that this is the way things are. We begin to understand what the appearances of things seem to be saying. Science compels us to face the factual appearance of things and forego premature simplification and wishful thinking. Science disenchants, destroys my rapture at the beauty and harmony of the world. Instead, it fills me with horror at the cacophony, meaninglessness, and unaccountable destruction of things. In a second sense, experiencing my genuine ignorance, I grow aware, if indirectly, of the unity transcending and secretly motivating my entire search for knowledge. Only this unity gives life and meaning to my search. This meaning can no longer be rationally defined because it is beyond knowledge. Since it is unknowable, it cannot serve as the presupposition for our choice of scientific objectives and methods. Only after we have committed ourselves to the quest for knowledge can we learn the source and meaning of knowledge. If I ask myself where all this knowledge is headed for, I can only answer in metaphorical terms. It is as though the world wanted itself to be known, as though it were part of our glorification of God in this world to get to know the world with all our God-given faculties, to rethink, as it were, the thoughts of God, even if we ourselves can never grasp them except as they are reflected in the universe as we know it. To the extent that learning is guided by the original impulse to rational inquiry, an impulse at once responsive and yet transcending the world about us, to that extent alone, it has meaning and value. Though it is philosophy which provides this guidance, it cannot be expected to produce at will what must be left to mature spontaneously within each thinker by himself. From all this I can conclude that science is not the firm ground on which I can rest. It is the road along which I travel so that I may grow aware of the transcendence guiding my will to know. I travel this road with all that restless thirst for knowledge which characterizes our life in the realm of time. Granting this view of science as a way, not an end, we shall understand that our many frustrations with knowledge are due to a loss of inner guidance. We recognize that loss whenever we allow ourselves to drift, whether from idle curiosity or because science has just become something to keep us busy. These are blind alleys from which we keep returning to heed that inner sense of direction which determines our course of study and research. We have a bad conscience when we give in to mere industry to drown our sense of hopelessness. Such industry cannot disguise the deadly inertia of meaningless work. Instead, we ought to make ourselves receptive to the ideas which guide our work. These ideas stem from the transcendent wholeness motivating our search. This concept of wholeness which guides our search, however, is not unequivocal. No one is able to grasp it in its fullness or to claim that what he grasps is universally true. No one can claim to be its sole possessor. This guidance becomes effective only in the dialogue between the thinker and the manifold objects of knowledge. It is realized through the continued forward and upward surge of learning at each point in history. It involves trial and risk. This is why science can supply the driving force toward truth and truthfulness in our daily lives. Okay, I'm just going to say I think that there might be a typo in this next sentence, but we'll we'll just read it the way that it says and if you, i hope that you will get the thrust of what it's saying science unmasks illusions with which i would like to make life more bearable 
by which I hope to replace faith or at least to transform faith into certain knowledge. Science disperses half-truths which serve to hide realities I am unable to face. It breaks up the premature constructs which uncritical thinking sets in the place of tireless research. It keeps us from lapsing into deceptive complacency. Science furnishes a maximal clarity concerning the condition of man in general and by my own person. Science provides the conditions without which I cannot live up to the challenge implicit in my native capacity for knowledge. Fulfilling this task is man's great destiny. It challenges him to show what he can make of himself through knowledge. Science springs from honesty and produces it. We cannot be truthful unless we have absorbed a scientific attitude and mode of thought. It is characteristic for a scientific attitude always to differentiate between what is known cogently and what is known and what is not known cogently. I want to know what I know and what I don't know. This knowledge includes the way which leads to knowledge and the boundaries within which this knowledge is valid. The unscientific attitude is further characterized by readiness to accept any criticism of one's assertions. For the thinking man, for the scientist and philosopher in particular, criticism is a necessary condition of life. There can never be enough of the kind of questioning which compels him to examine his insights. A genuine scientist can profit even from unjustified criticism. He who avoids being criticized essentially does not want to know. Once the radical will to know, which forms the basis of the scientific quest for knowledge, has become existential reality in the life of the human being, no conditions of time and place can unmake that fact. For whom does science come to life? Not for those who lose themselves in the never-ending diversity of harmless facts, which they accept without ever questioning their possible significance, nor for those who painfully strain to learn material in order to pass examinations or in order to prepare themselves to practice a given occupation. Knowledge comes to life for the real scientist. His extraordinary patience and toil become inflamed with enthusiasm. Science becomes the principle animating his whole life. Today, as at all times, the magic of science can be experienced by young people for whom the world is challenging. And today, too, perhaps even more than ever before, we experience the burden of science. Science endangers both the naive strength of the non-self-conscious as well as the illusions requisite for living, what Ibsen called the life lies. It takes courage to conceive by questioning instead of merely learning by rote. The old maxim still applies, sapir ade. Dare to know. Science and philosophy. We are now in a position to make some coherent statements about the relationship of science and philosophy. These two do not coincide. Nor is philosophy just one science among others. It is, in fact, essentially different in origin, method, and meaning. Nevertheless, science and philosophy are closely connected. The relationship of science to philosophy. Science defends itself against the confusions attendant upon it's being linked up with philosophy. It fights what it takes to be the fruitless interference of speculative effort. In brief, it develops a characteristic hostility towards philosophy. Yet science is able to acknowledge its own limits. Since it does not grasp the whole of truth, it leaves philosophy free to cultivate its own area of inquiry. It neither endorses nor denies the value of philosophical findings. It does not interfere so long as philosophy itself does not pass judgments upon matters accessible to scientific research. Science keeps close watch on philosophy in order to keep it from advancing unfounded statements in imaginary proofs. Science does this to the advantage of both science and philosophy. Science stands in need of philosophical direction, but not in the sense that philosophy is used by science itself or furnishes science with its proper objectives. These are precisely the ways in which science and philosophy are not to be related. Rather, philosophy is effective in motivating a genuine will to know. Philosophy also furnishes those ideas from which the scientist derives his vision and which determine his choices by impressing his whole person with the essential importance of knowing. Philosophy pervades science. It guides it without itself being accessible to scientific methods. Thus, science pervaded by philosophy is philosophy become concrete. As the scientists grow aware of the implications of their own activity, they do in fact consciously philosophize. The kind of benefit the scholar and scientist derives from philosophy is not of a practical sort. In studying philosophy, they do, however, 
grow aware of the total context of their work. Moreover, they acquire new and stronger motivations for research and a heightened awareness of what their scientific activity means. The Relationship of Philosophy to Science Philosophy acknowledges science as indispensable to it. Although aware of its difference from science, genuine philosophy acknowledges its bond to science. Philosophy never permits itself to ignore realities accessible to knowledge. Philosophy demands to know whatever is real and cogent. It wants what is real and cogent to become fruitful for its growing self-awareness. Whoever philosophizes is impelled toward the sciences and seeks experience in the scientific method. Because the scientific attitude guarantees truthfulness, philosophy becomes the champion of science against anti-science. Philosophy considers the preservation of a scientific mode of thought indispensable to the preservation of human dignity. Philosophy recognizes the truth of Mephisto's threat to stain reason and science, the greatest of all human powers, and I have you in my grasp. Thank you for listening to this audio recording by David McCarricker, published by Theory Underground. This work has been placed in the public domain because of its importance. I hope that you all enjoy this during your holidays in its small daily doses, like an advent calendar. And that if you are intrigued to hear lectures on the topic of the idea of the university, then I hope you will consider joining the course that I am leading with Brian Weeks and Ann Snellgrove, the three of us, all educators, interested in the idea of higher education and a kind of learning environment that cares about the freedom of individuals to be able to research what they find most interesting as opposed to what big business or political partisans think you ought to be researching. I'm going to actually show you all really quick what the website looks like. So you go to theory-underground.com. Make sure to register with the website and then go to courses right here. You can also go to events and get to it that way. And then right here you see Mikey teaches Zizek for they know not what they do. That's a class that kicks off in February. We also have professional managerial class consciousness that's kicking off at the end of January. And I'm teaching that one with Elton. And then the idea of the university right here. All three of these are courses that you can add to your shopping cart and choose to take if you want. But the idea of the university, if you click on it, if you're not already logged in, then this is what you should see. Click take this course, click add to cart, view cart, and then proceed to checkout. Oh, one quick thing, don't forget, I guarantee the verification email will be sent to your spam folder. So if you're going, I tried to sign up with the website, I registered and everything, I just didn't never get the, I never got the email, uh, don't worry, it's in your spam folder. You just have to find it and you might not be able to find it from your phone, you might have to actually sit down at a laptop. I'm sorry, it's not always as easy as giant mega corporations make it when you try to do stuff underground. So. Go for it. Try it out. Let me know if it works. Okay, bye. So anyway, that's how you do it. I hope to see you there in the discussions on the Zoom chat, but also in the forums where the real conversation will hopefully be taking place on the website. Anyway, everyone, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Take care.